So, let's introduce Tracy Paxton. She is... She has been... Uh, she's got a BS in in health administration, in communication, and a master in social work. She's been working in the social work field since 2006, proudly working at the Ohio Health MS Clinic since October 2016. She's previous, her previous experience working as a community-based social worker and hospice worker. She's a founding member of the Ohio Health Caregiver Support Group, and she's a strong patient and caregiver advocate. Let's welcome Tracy Paxton. everyone. It's, hey, nice to see some familiar faces. Puts me at ease. I have to admit this is the largest group I've ever been in front of. Till today it was about 50, so you guys are impressive. I want to talk a little bit today about um, MS, the emotional part. It's huge. Make sure my slides work here. Okay, so my goals are pretty simple today. I want each of us to recognize the importance of maintaining social connections. Um, and I want us to learn of resources and strategies to improve our emotional well-being. And that's for everyone in the room, not just our folks living with MS. Friends, family, caregiver, your emotional well-being is so important as well. So the social impact of MS. Living with MS may have a profound impact on a person's social roles and their care partner's well-being. We know this for several reasons. Um, ones that stick out is MS does not go away. Because symptom exacerbations are unpredictable for many folks living with MS, that can be a real challenge to maintain your desired roles. And when I talk about what are our desired roles or what are our roles, that's you know in society, you're a mother, a friend, an accountant, a teacher. We know that all of those roles are very important to you. So MS symptoms, we know they can create stress. We know that um, that can impact your ability to maintain your roles. And those roles might be um, in your relationships. So canceling activities. How many of you have had a really bad fatigue day and canceled a dinner? Haven't made it to your exercise class. Had to call off work even. Um, intimacy issues with our romantic partners. We know that MS has a financial impact on us out-of-pocket medical bills, having to choose to pay for that MRI versus pay for the child's basketball camp. We know those are stressful things. And we know that work can be impacted. Not being able to work in your previous role, not being able to work full time. We know those are really important things to recognize. And the biggie, that a chronic condition like MS can increase your risk of depression and anxiety. We see that every day. Um, why is that? Damage to the area of the brain that influences your mood immune system changes, changes and losses of your roles. So, Talking real briefly about MS and family, um, we recognize when a person is diagnosed with MS, there's an impact on all who love them. Um, those worries of what happens next, how do we plan, how do we manage life now. MS impacts daily roles, life, responsibilities, Shared goals and dreams might seem out of reach, which we don't want you to think that's the case. Um, and the other thing that we see very common is family members may experience similar emotions to the person with MS as they adapt to life in their, or MS in their life. So that can be the same feelings of guilt, anger, denial, anxiety. Anxiety is a fairly universal response to the unknown, and anger and frustration can build when the answers and solutions seem out of reach. Depression is very common in care partners. Spouses, parents, other family members can benefit from the same coping strategies and the same techniques as folks living with MS. We encourage all care partners, a family member support system, to communicate with your health care providers just as the MS patient would um, communicate with their neurologist or nurse practitioner. MS and care partners, so a little bit more specifically. Care partners we most often see to be a spouse. However, it could be an adult child, a, a friend. Responsibilities can vary. It can be from managing household duties, to assisting with medical needs, to being an emotional um, support person. 
We know that caring with, for someone with MS is deeply rewarding. We know it can be very satisfying. People can be drawn closer together. But we also recognize that there are challenges that come along with that. Physically, it can be very tiring. Emotionally, it can be very exhausting. According to the, the um, Family Caregiver Alliance, studies consistently report higher levels of depressive, depressive symptoms among care partners than their non-care partner peers. And in that report, one-fifth of care partners reported they were exhausted by the time they went to bed at night. We recognize that roles will likely change over time. As roles change and needs change, it's important to do a few things. There's a lot of things we can do, but I'm going to focus on a couple today. The first one is communicate with each other. You know, what are my abilities? What do I feel are my strengths? Where do I feel I need help? And we can plan from there. Um, if a person living with MS is starting to have some physical dis you know, difficulties, they might still be able to be you know, a strong source of emotional support for the family. They might still be able to maintain the bills, do a lot of the telephone task work. So it's important to look at where our strengths and abilities are and work together. And then the other thing I want to talk about, it's really important to connect with other people. Um, care partners often need the support of other people who are in the trenches with them. And people living with MS need to be sometimes around folks who live with MS. We talk um, about that nobody gets it, kind of how he was doing with the exercises, um, you know, trying to make us understand what people with MS are living, what challenges they're living with each day. So. Social isolation, um, connecting with people is very important for our well-being. Limited interaction can lead to social isolation. When we need isolation, it can have great benefits. We can rest better, we can have recovery time, we can have stress reduction. But when we get into um, having too much isolation, we can see folks do, don't do as well emotionally or physically. Studies suggest cl can Clinical depression is more frequent among people with MS than the general population or folks with other chronic illnesses, and a big contributing factor is being isolated. So emotional isolation, that's the living in the non-MS world. That's where we'll talk a little in a few minutes, a few slides about how do we connect with other people in our MS world. And disclosure is an important thing. Sometimes. Um, disclosure is forced upon you because people see you the walker, they see the cane, um, but sometimes it's something that when you're comfortable and ready, you can have control over. Uh, physical isolation, this can be caused by fatigue. I'm very tired at the end of the day. I don't get to get out and see my kid's ball game. I'm not going to go to the church activity. And it could be a lot of times we see due to mobility issues, people are very afraid to fall outside of their home. And so sometimes this is a choice. And I really, we want to um, address that worry and concern early on so that you don't fall into a pattern of pulling away from activity. So some tips to avoid being um, isolated. Prioritize, we, we've heard this from several speakers today, the importance of prioritizing things. But plan for the best part of the day. If you know after you get up and take your shower, you're gonna be exhausted for a little while, you might not wanna run to the next thing. Um, if you know that the middle of the day is the best time for you, go for it, make your plans then. And use the adaptive equipment that can help you. Don't pull away from using the motorized cart to go all through the mall. Um, use those things that are going to help you reach your goals of getting out and about. Start small and take charge. We've talked about you know small goals, smart goals. Um, so maybe that is I'm going to schedule one weekly activity at the Dempsey Center. Uh, that's a great resource available to all of you. So maybe it's going to be inviting people to you. You host the card club. You host the book club. Um, Use the telephone and computer. They're great resources that we have now. You can connect with your friends, your family, your healthcare team even. I'll give you some ideas for some online supports as we uh, progress here. Seeking professional sports, you heard about that earlier as well. Professional counseling can have great benefits. You can learn to um, cope with adjustment to your condition, transitioning to or from the workforce, relationship challenges, fear of the unknown, and I think that's where it can be super beneficial. It's great to get a handle on things early, so as things move along, you have support in place and coping techniques on board. 
Connecting with people with MS. Support groups and gatherings. Can't stress the importance of these enough. They provide a safe environment to share feelings, concerns, and be understood. And I think all of those three things are just crucial. They provide an opportunity to share coping techniques. You know, what worked? How did you, how was your vacation? How did you manage to get down to the beach? How did you manage to get through the airport? We can really learn from each other. The big thing too is they remind us that we are not alone, which is, I think, very important. They can be community-based or online, and I'll share a little bit about how to connect with both of those. At the um, Ohio Health MS Clinic, we are busy, busy with our support groups. We welcome everyone in the community to join us. We have a Living with MS group, that's an ongoing group open to everyone in the room. Um, and then it's followed by an, an education presentation by our um, neurologists, nurse practitioners, it's a great way to have a social component and then the educational piece. Because I think education is very important to, um, you know, dealing with your symptoms, understanding what's going on just as much as the social support. Young adult gathering. I think I've seen a few of you folks in the room who join us. Um, we actually test, we're testing this year the opportunity to go off site um, and gathering at a, a local restaurant or whatnot. So first time we did that, it was pretty successful. So we'll keep work on, we will keep building on that uh, concept. I'm starting a lunch and learn program. So we'll have folks join us for lunch. Um, I recognize sometimes folks with vision issues or being tired, it's hard to get out in the evening, so we're gonna shoot for this. This is our newest, newest endeavor, and we're gonna start here on March 15th, so just a couple weeks. Care partner supports. Um, these are so valuable. The National MS, the MS Foundation, um, MS of America, they have a lot of online emotional support uh, resources, I encourage you to check those out. And then I want to mention we do have a great in-person group that's going on at the Dempsey Center that's located at Riverside Hospital as well. And I believe I've talked to a couple loved ones in the past couple months who are going and have found this to be a great support. The Dempsey Center, we keep talking about that. Um, thank you, Dempsey family, for this uh, donation. We have free classes, so not too many places can you get education from certified physical therapists, massage therapists, neuro-certified music therapists, you name it. These are very professional folks who are well-trained and work with folks with neurological conditions. So I'd encourage you to try that chair yoga class, try that art therapy class. Music therapy uses your whole brain. It's a wonderful resource. Um, relaxation benefits are phenomenal. But we also have some uh, mental health support-based uh, groups there as well. So behavioral health support groups. So if you're helping to support a loved one with depression and anxiety, you can connect with others. And they'd started a de depression-specific group um, this past December, I believe it was. If you're not in the Columbus area, can't get to us really easily, I would encourage you to use the National MS website to connect with a navigator who can put you in touch with resources that are close to home. All right. I want to touch on this because um, it's just something I find I have conversations with folks about pretty often in the clinic. And I'm so sorry I'm facing this way all the time. There's the screen's there, so disclaimer there. Um, so the importance of accepting help. If you're adapting to a new role, you've had a role change, um, having a support team, which you often hear us refer to as your village, is extremely valuable. Um, but we need to learn and be open to accepting help from our village. So I want to give you a couple suggestions here when you're working on this challenge. Consider asking for help as a strength and not a weakness. It's a strength to be able to acknowledge when you need assistance, and the sooner you can understand that, the sooner the better. Rather than assuming that asking someone for help is a burden, realize that your, your asking shows your strength and can ultimately make the people around you feel needed. Think of asking as help as finding a different perspective. When someone's going through something as challenging as an MS diagnosis or a relapse, it can be hard sometimes to find out-of-the-box solutions. But when you ask for help, 
um, you know, you're being vulnerable and you're sharing what's going on, giving folks around you a better understanding of what's going on. And sometimes that can um, be really helpful to see a different perspective and hopefully find a novel solution to the concern. Remember that today is not every day. And I think that's very challenging to do. But when you're in the middle of a relapse, when you're in the middle of an, um, dealing with a new symptom, you might think this is how it's going to be from now and forever, which might not be the case. So I want to encourage you to think, OK, what do I need to do today? And sometimes that can be not as overwhelming then. Prioritize your day. This has been a theme. It's so important. Um, it can be overwhelming if you try to do too much. So maybe it's I do the laundry today and I do the grocery shopping tomorrow. You know, what can wait and begin by cutting out or postponing things that maybe aren't too essential in your day. Listen rather than solve. This is a challenge for a lot of us. Um, but when you're asking for help, um, it can sometimes be disempowering to have someone just jump in and immediately fix it for you. Uh, it's our nature to want to fix, but sometimes we need to focus on just listening and giving someone an opportunity to share. So I encourage you all to give people good space to be a good listener. Be of service and be open to receiving support. Care partners, um, you tend to try to carry uh, all the burden on your shoulders, but you sometimes need some help as well. So I encourage you to definitely raise your hand when you need a break, okay? Mood Lifters 101, that's Hazel, Shame, shameless plug. Um, okay, so now we're ready to connect with others, but let's take a second to review some coping techniques and positive um, outlets that have proven results that we can try to incorporate in our day now. Exercise. I, I don't know. You probably thought, oh my gosh, I heard it from the PTs. I've heard it from the neurologists. The social worker is really going to drill exercise into my brain? Yep, sure am. Um, this increases endorphins. It lessens fatigue. It promotes an improved mood, which can help your outlook. So going to give that plug for exercise. Journaling, this is something that is super easy. Just grab a scrap piece of paper and start writing down feelings, getting those things out. Journaling can be done. I know I have a couple friends who um, write three good things that happened that day at the end of their night so they can go to bed on a positive note. You can use journaling in a lot of different ways um, to get anxious thoughts out. If you want some more information, I'll gladly be able to share that with you. Um, Commit to one activity a week. We've talked about that. Set a goal. Um, be accountable to a group. I think sometimes um, that's a big push to be out there. So set a, set a realistic goal, and that can make you feel fulfilled, competent, and in control. Develop a spiritual interest. A chronic diagnosis can threaten a person's sense of self. So nature, prayer, meditation, religion, they can all help you feel connected to something outside of yourself. So your church might be the great outdoors and taking a little hike on a Sunday afternoon. Help others, volunteering. This is something that um, I've been talking with folks about a lot lately. It is a great way to build your self-esteem. It can combat negative feelings of self-image. It's a great way to share your talents, to share your knowledge, and it can help you build your social network. Um, reward yourself. Do something. You know, you've re you set a goal. You reached that goal. Go out for that Starbucks coffee. Go, you know, to the mall and buy the new tennis shoes because you've been exercising and your other ones are getting worn out. Spend time with a pet. Um, we saw some of you might have been petting on Boone, the therapy dog, a little bit ago. But pets are a great way to help you set a daily routine. They give you a reason to get up in the morning, um, to get the dog walked, fed, taken care of. Uh, they give you unconditional love, affection. So if feasible, pets are highly encouraged. Create a gratitude list. Focus on positives. We know that not everything is positive. There's going to be negatives. But sometimes if you can appreciate what is going well, um, then it can, it can be a, a good way to notice the trends and, and the positives that are in your life. Practice forgiveness. Um, this is going to be important to lower your blood pressure. But um, if we hold, a, hold in those resentful feelings, they can have negative impacts on our life. 
laugh. Laughter is therapeutic. Smile, read a funny book, watch a funny movie. Laughter is a way to connect with other people. Whoopsie. Okay, so some of you, maybe it's hard to get out and it's really bad when the weather's cold or when it's rainy, you know, the spasticity days kick in and you just don't feel like you can get out. There are always ways you can connect online with people and apps now on our phone and I bet 95% of you have a smartphone in here, I'd assume. So, um, here's one app that, that you might wanna check out if you haven't. These are games to help you learn how to be happier. It was tracked by scientists and they say that 86% of the folks who use this app see their symptom happiness improve over the months. They have free um, tracks about conquering negative thoughts, defeating, neg or defeating loneliness, so these are helpful. Calm, this is one of the number one mindfulness apps out there. There's guided relaxation, there are um, what else is on that app? Let's see here, nature sounds, scenes, um, relaxing music. So there's a meditation from beginner, I've never done this, to I'm more advanced. So that's a great way to um, work on mindfulness. It, mindfulness is shown to increase our quality of life, improve coping skills, reduce depression, anxiety, reduce perceived stress, reduce fatigue and pain. So gotta give that one a try. Breathing, deep breathing is one of my favorite things to talk about. You can do this in the car, you can do this sitting on the toilet, it doesn't matter where you are, I love this technique. Um, so this app can teach you how to deep breathe and do it well, so download that today. And I wanted just to point out some resources from our national partners because they can help us with some of our barriers. Um, the National MS Society, if you have financial concerns about how do I get that equipment that'll help me get out of the house, you might wanna log on and or call a navigator and try to connect with them. They also have programs for emotional well-being, videos, there's some really great resources on their webpage. MSAA, I use these guys quite often when those MRI funds, or when those MRI costs come around. Um, they, they're a great financial resource. One thing I wanna talk about too, which actually I don't think has come up, um, the heat sensitivity issue. We're coming up into that time of year and they have a cooling equipment program. So um, if you're looking to get a vest, wrists, hats, you know, they've got the whole nine yards. So we can help you um, navigate through their system as well. These guys have a great program, computer assistance program, and I've had worked with a few people that have taken advantage of this. Let's get you a computer at home so you can be connected to other folks, as well as the assistive technology program. But the one thing I really like that they have is the Brighter Tomorrow grant, and that's a $1,000 grant for what will make your life better. Um, it might be you wanna buy craft supplies. You know, it might be, um, you know, I don't know, you tell me, what would make your life better? It's up to you to send in the application. Did somebody say something? Oh, I thought someone shouted something out, I'm sorry. So, this is a great resource. Gather MS, this is a really neat website. If you have not checked this out, please do. The MS uh, clinic team, we all pulled together, so doctors, nurses, PTs, everybody, and we came up with a list of what resources do we send our patients out to check, check on. And it's broken down into several categories, so if you have a specific need, you can jump on there. Community support, day-to-day -day support, health and wellness, emotional support, um, they have event information, and work and life planning, so it's specific to Columbus. There's a handful of big cities across the country and we jumped on board to partner and create our own. These guys, you might have heard of them, They're here. To, we're here working with them today, but another great resource for education and support. And we are, um, on Twitter and Facebook, and I'm gonna guess maybe one or two of you have seen a Facebook Live Dr. Boster's done, or maybe you've seen him on YouTube, just maybe. He might be starting his Saturday out with a cup of coffee saying, shoot your questions at me. 
a great way to connect with people, a great way to ask your questions. So please follow along with us. Um, these are also, I point out, very reliable places to get your information. Sometimes the internet can be a little scary if you just start Googling things. So I'd encourage you to check in with your healthcare provider if you're like, concerned about something, you know, a website, we'll, we'll lead you in the right direction. But yeah, follow us if you haven't already. Get on there this afternoon and make sure you're linked up. So today I just want to encourage you to think positively, breathe deeply, live simply, give generously, hug tightly, laugh loudly, speak kindly, love unconditionally, smile brightly, and dream nightly. Ooh, how about that? We got one speaker left. By the way, for um, for everybody that wonders why we don't do breaks, 170 people here today. How many spots are in the bathroom? <laughs> That's why we can't. All right, so um, it's not on. Okay, so. Um, I mean, again, that's the reason. So a lot of you might be thinking that some people when they have been outside have been questioning me about that, and that is the reason why we can't. If we did a break, it would take another hour and change to get restarted again. So I hope you could all understand that. Thank you. All right, our next speaker, Aaron Boster. And I know he's in the back of the room because he's going to want to run up on the stage. Dr. Boster is an undergraduate of Oberlin College. He's gone to the Medical School University of Cincinnati, internship and residency of Michigan, fellowship at Wayne State University, associate professor at Ohio State University. He is the current systems medical chief of neurology, neuroimmunology, and director of the MS Center of Ohio Health. And in my opinion, he is the Shakespeare of multiple sclerosis talks. Let's welcome Dr. Boster. Thanks, Stu. Get a jump. No running? No jumping? Oh, you don't do that anymore? Okay. Give me a hug. No way. Again? I Great. Howdy! Howdy! That was close. You guys are warmed up a little bit. Let's try that one more time on the count of one, two, three. Howdy! Howdy! How is everyone? Thank you very, very much. Take a moment and look around the room. Take a look, look at all these villagers here. What an amazing village we have put together. I am overwhelmed. This is like Christmas for me, which as a little Jewish guy has special meaning because I've never done that before. <laughs> this is fantastic. I want to give a couple shout outs. In the back of the room are my colleagues from Ohio Health. You guys are amazing. I am so proud of us and what we've accomplished. Can we give them a thank you? We have partnered with MS Views and News. Why? Because they're amazing. This is being live streamed, which means there's people all over the world that are watching this, and I want them to understand something very special about Ohio. OH! Ohio! OH! Ohio! OH! Ohio! OH! Ohio! Just in case you're curious, world. <laughs> I was at a conference, an international conference, and there was a bunch of doctors milling around, drinking wine, and there was a gentleman who takes care of MS patients from Tel Aviv, Israel. And he said, you know, in Israel, we give people with MS rolled joints for free, paid for by the government. And I said, you do? Why? And he said, what do you mean, why? Because it sucks to have MS and it makes them feel better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Today, I'm gonna talk to you about cannabis and multiple sclerosis. And in case you are a plant from the FDA, I'm in compliance, so pfft, that's my rap sheet. But I want to start by talking about guardrails. This is a very hot topic, extremely hot topic. And there's a tremendous amount of history surrounding cannabis and cannabinoids and its use in the United States. There's a lot of cultural discussion about cannabis and its use in MS and cannabis and its use on Friday and a lot of other things in the United States. There's a tremendous discussion about the legalization of marijuana in various states throughout 
the United States. And I'm choosing today not to talk about any of that. Not at all. Because those things can change over time. But what's not going to change is the science behind the endocannabinoid system and the scientific evidence supporting or not supporting the use of cannabis and multiple sclerosis. It is my hope that over the next 30, 40 minutes, I can help educate you on the science behind cannabis and cannabinoids in MS so that you can take that knowledge and it will help inform your decision about culture and about history and about things related to the law. So let's get started. What is the endocannabinoid system? Well, I'm glad you asked. Cannabinoids are chemicals that bind to cannabinoid receptors. And there are different sources of cannabinoids. The endocannabinoids, endo is a Latin root for inside. These are cannabinoids that human beings make in our own bodies. Some people don't know that. We make our own endocannabinoids. Phytocannabinoids are derived from plants. Maybe some of you have heard of this plant called ganja. Any of you? Have you read about it? Um, and so marijuana is an example of a phytocannabinoid source. Synthetically, we can construct cannabinoids in laboratories. And so there's lots of different places where we can derive cannabinoids. Now to focus on the endocannabinoid system, the human body is constructed with cannabinoid receptors. We make our own cannabinoids that bind to these receptors and this system modulates neurotransmission. It's fascinating. In fact, the endocannabinoid system has influence in our metabolism and appetite, it has influence in anti-inflammatory effects and on effects of the immune response. The endocannabinoid system modulates pain. It is involved in movement and memory. It's a fascinating system that I was not taught about when I attended medical school. Now, to add a layer of complexity, there are different endocannabinoid receptors in the human body. There's actually a bunch of them. And today, I'm going to talk to you about the two most predominant receptor sites. There's the CB1 receptor, which I've shown you in that Kelly green, and the CB2 receptor in blue. The CB1 receptor is expressed on various parts of the human body, including fat and liver and muscle, and importantly, the supercomputer that runs the body, the central nervous system, the brain. When you stimulate the CB1 receptor, there are psychoactive properties, which is a medical way of saying you can get high. Now, in counterpoint, when you stimulate the CB2 receptor, you're stimulating different organ systems. And in fact, the CB2 receptor is not expressed in the central compartment. There's no psychoactive properties associated with stimulation of CB2 receptor. These structures where you find CB2 are predominantly immune cells throughout the human body. Very interesting. And so we have the CB1 receptor and we have the CB2 receptor. And I'm going to come back to them. But first I wanted to talk about this interesting weed called cannabis. Cannabis is a plant which is indigenous to parts of Asia and is now found throughout Ohio. And in fact, we have identified more than 100 different biologically active phytocannabinoids in the cannabis plant. Over 100 phytocannabinoids have been identified in this one plant. And what's fascinating is we haven't studied most of them. But the two most predominant phytocannabinoids are THC and CBD. Why? They're the most biologically active and they mimic our own endocannabinoids the very best. So let's take a moment and talk about THC and CBD. The cannabinoid THC binds to the CB1 receptor. Remember I told you that when you stimulate the CB1 receptor, you can have psychoactive properties. Taking THC 
stimulating CB1 in the brain can result in psychoactive properties. CBD doesn't bind to the CB1 receptor, it doesn't bind in the brain. And as a result, stimulation of the CB2 receptor through CBD doesn't cause psychoactive properties at all. Very, very different results from these two different predominant cannabinoids, THC and CBD. Going back to a moment to talk about this cannabis plant, boy, I learned a lot when I was prepping this lecture. I learned that there are different species of cannabis. There is the species sativa and the cannabis indica. Now, cannabis sativa has a higher predominance of CBD. Cannabis indica has a higher predominance of THC. But in 2019, that loses some of its gusto because any cannabis plant that you might come in contact with or read about on the radio will be a hybrid of these two different plants because they've been cultivated and they've been bred. And in reality, most of the plants that are available today are hybrids, combinations of the two. The most common way to ingest cannabis is to light it on fire and smoke and breathe in the smoke. So we're inhaling combusted cannabis. And to remind you of how this works, you see in this cartoon, we suck in the smoke and it goes down into our lungs and it goes into the alveoli where it passes the cell membrane and the cannabinoids are absorbed into the bloodstream. And then they circulate in the bloodstream and bind to the receptors I just mentioned. Now, if you roll a really fat blunt and you suck on it really hard, you're gonna have more active compound in your blood than if you had a little tiny joint and just puffed on it a small amount. The way that you use or the way that you inhale literally changes the amount of active substance. And as a result, it is darn near impossible to control the dose that you're receiving when you toke is needed. Now, as a result of this, pharmaceutical companies are not exploring smoked cannabis as a route of administration because they literally can't control the meter dose. And in fact, they're exploring other mechanisms or other routes of administration where they can have more control over how much the human being receives. So this cartoon is sort of the cannabinoid playing field of 2019. On the left in blue, that's ganja, that's marijuana, that's inhaled smoked cannabis like we just talked about. And what you'll see there is when you light a joint and inhale the smoke, it's a very fast onset of action and it wears off pretty quickly. As you move from left to right in that, we'll say mauve color, we see an oral mucosal spray. This is a product called Sativex I'm gonna be talking about throughout the rest of the lecture. And this oral mucosal spray, think albuterol inhaler, is sprayed into the mouth, absorbed through the mucosal lining in the mouth, and absorbed in the body and it's fast. It's not as fast as inhaling smoke, but it's a fast onset of action, and it lasts a little longer than smoked cannabis. As you move farther from left to right into the green area, these are different ways of ingesting cannabinoids by eating it. And there where it says cannabis, that's the pot brownie that I joked about bringing to the talk today. I thought that would be hilarious if we passed out brownies. Um, <laughs> My administrators did not. <laughs> and as you go farther to the right, we see two synthetic cannabinoid products. Many of you have heard of Marinol, which is a product for chemo-induced nausea and inability to eat. And what you see is it takes much longer to metabolize and digest the edible products, and they last a lot longer in the human body. Now, I wanna talk a little bit more about this Sativex. Sativex is approved for spasticity associated with MS in the United Kingdom and in our neighbor to the north in Canada. 
It is not available in the United States outside of research. It is an extract of cannabis sativa, which we talked about earlier. So it's not synthetic, it's actually extracting THC and CBD from the plant. And it's in a one-to-one -one ratio of THC and CBD, which is a relatively high concentration of CBD. If you have a plant that you're smoking, it may have two or 3% CBD. This is 50% CBD because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, the average MS sativa user is spraying about eight times a day. And each spray gives exactly 2.7 milligrams of THC and 2.5 milligrams of CBD. And as you see, most people aren't going beyond 12 sprays a day. Now, this is about as sciencey as we're gonna get, folks. And I apologize for the color, but I stole this off the internet as is from Russo et al. This was published in 2006. And please follow along with me. The light color, this, the, this, the lightest color that you see if you look on the left is the smoke cannabis. And on the x-axis going from left to right is time in minutes. So you get older as you go from left to right. On the y-axis going up and down is the concentration of THC in your blood. When you smoke a joint, very, very quickly, there is a sky high concentration of THC and you see that spike all the way up to 150. And then you see it plummets back down very quickly. This is called the pharmacokinetics of the, of the molecule. Now the, the dotted line, this black dotted line is vaporized THC. And so if you vape THC, you also have a fast onset, but not as fast or as high, pun not intended, as if you smoke a joint. And you see that it tapers down a little bit slower. It lasts a little bit longer than if you smoke it. Now look at the very bottom of the graph, the gray dotted line. That's the plasma concentration of Sativex, that oral mucosal spray. By comparison, it's not even the same sport. It's barely tickling the receptors and it lasts for quite some time in the body. You could empty the entire container of Sativex into your mouth all at one time and you couldn't feel any psychoactive effects. And this graph explains that difference. I want you to keep this graph in mind as I make some other comparisons moving forward. Cannabinoids do not treat multiple sclerosis like a disease modifying therapy. Cannabis does not slow the progression of multiple sclerosis. That's not what we're talking about. When we talk about using cannabinoids to treat MS, we're talking about treating MS symptoms, which is very, very important because it's about quality of life. Any team member of mine will tell you, if we slow your disease down and you're miserable, we failed and we don't. In order to feel proud in what we do, we have to do two things. We have to slow your disease process and improve the quality of your life. And so addressing symptoms is terribly important. And that's what we're talking about when we discuss the use of cannabinoids to treat MS symptoms. The, the very best data for the use of cannabinoids in all of neurology is spasticity in MS. And so I am going to review with you nearly 100 clinical trials which have studied the use of cannabinoids to treat spasticity in MS. And I'm going to summarize it with one cartoon. Here's what we've learned. Cannabis and cannabinoid products are very well tolerated by people with MS. When this has been studied, one common theme is that the side effect profile, the adverse events are mild to moderate, they're minimal, and this is a very well tolerated substance in people with MS. That's one thing that we take away. The second thing that we take away when studying cannabinoids to treat MS spasticity is that patient report improves. People who have MS and they're spastic and they take a cannabinoid product in a study oftentimes report based on patient reported outcomes, hey man, how you doing, one through 10, that there's improvement to their spasticity subjectively. However, 
Every single trial, with one exception, has failed to demonstrate an objective benefit that the examiner could see. Let that sink in for a second. Every single trial I looked at, there were some improvements to patient reported outcome measures. On a one through 10 scale, where's your spasticity now? It's better, doc. But when the physician evaluates the patient objectively, they're not able to discern a difference with one exception. And that was a study done with Sativex. But I want to explain the science behind the study because it sits not well with me. There was a clinical trial done with Sativex where they took a bunch of people with MS that were spastic and they were taking medicines for spasticity and it wasn't cutting it. And they gave them all Sativex for two weeks and they brought them all back and they segregated them on people that said they felt better and people that did not. And all the people that did not were dismissed from the trial. So they collected in what we call an enriched group of patients. They were enriched. They, they were responders. Then they divided that group in half and gave half Sativex and half fake Sativex. And what they found was the group that got the real stuff showed an objective improvement. That is a rather unusual scientific design, in my opinion. And it's the only trial to date in the history of every trial done studying MS spasticity that demonstrated an objective benefit. I'm citing here a paper, Whiting et al. This is a really large meta-analysis review in a highly prestigious journal called JAMA. And it looked at every single spasticity MS trial using cannabinoids. And the conclusion was as follows. There is a moderately statistically significant benefit based on patient report, but they were unable to demonstrate a benefit objectively. Now, the way that we study it objectively is using the Ashworth. And I need a volunteer with an arm who can come up here so I can use your arm in public, and I'll give it back. This is an audience participation moment where I call in someone who then comes up to the stage. Let's give her a round of applause. We can, we'll have more than one person participating. We have opportunities for everyone. So I've got two wonderful limbs up here. I got all kinds of arms and legs. And what I want to show you is the way that we assess spasticity. So what we do, I'll start over here with this massive bulging bicep. Woo! And I'm going to feel the bicep muscle right here. Now you go loose like a rag doll. And then I'm going to move the full range of motion to make sure that it goes all the way so I can get full movement here. Then the instructions to the patient are you chuck chill out and I'm going to move it over a, a count of 1,001. And I'm feeling the resistance here in the arm. That's the way that we do the Ashworth scale. Let's give him a round of applause. And let me come over here and we're gonna do the exact same thing. So we're gonna range the arm and with the patient relaxing, I'm gonna move over a count of 1,001. And what I can tell you is as compared to our first volunteer, her arm is more stiff. There's more resistance when we move your arm. Now let's give them both a round of applause. It takes a lot of courage to come up here on stage. Thank you both very, very much. My point in sharing that with you is, that's a five point scale. One is a little catch, four is if I move you, I'm gonna break your limb. And when we study this with the whiting analysis, they demonstrated that in the trials, when you look at all the trials combined, they could improve the Ashworth by a fifth of a point on a one point scale, which is five times below the level of detection. And that is the science of objectively addressing spasticity in MS with cannabinoids. Now, before we move on, I have to talk about the quality of the data. Because when we say medical in front of the word marijuana, we assume culturally some things. Even without recognizing it, we assume that the quality of the data is on par with, say, ocrelizumab, natalizumab, gelenia, Lyrica, Topamax, these drugs that have been approved by the American FDA. And what I've learned is that the quality of the clinical trials have limitations, and I want you to understand that. First of all, the duration of almost all these trials studying 
cannabinoids and spasticity with MS lasted a couple weeks. There's no long-term follow-up with these trials. We don't know what happens years out because it was studied for a couple days or a couple weeks or maybe a month. And that's a limitation to our knowledge. The dose of cannabinoids was different throughout all these different trials. So in some trials, they got a little bit, and then sometimes they got a whole bunch. On average, it was about 20 to 40 milligrams of THC divided across the day. But as you can imagine, comparing a trial that gave you an itsy bit and a trial that gave you a whole hell of a lot might change what you see. Similarly, the formulation of the cannabinoids bears mentioning. There are almost zero trials, and there are no good trials looking at smoked ganja to help with spasticity. It wasn't studied. Moreover, there are almost no quality trials looking at edible cannabis to treat spasticity. Now that bothers me because that's what's available through our current medical marijuana programs here in the state. The only trial that really showed an impact is the one that I mentioned, Sativex, which is an oral mucosal spray not available in the United States. And none of these trials had a non-cannabinoid comparator. So in someone who is spastic, they compared cannabis against placebo. They didn't do cannabis against baclofen or cannabis against Botox, which leaves a bit to be desired. Now that is, for better or worse, the most robust data that we have available in all of the medical literature on cannabinoids. I do want to share with you some other symptoms that have been studied using cannabinoids in MS. And in reviewing many, many trials in preparation to talk to you today, there's a couple themes that I discovered. The first theme is, as we talk about bladder, ataxia, movement, pain, none of these trials, this was the primary outcome measure, meaning they didn't construct the trial to look at bladder, it was just a comment or a sidebar that was made. The second important point is that these trials were small, sometimes 10, 15 patients, and they lacked statistical power to identify an effect, meaning if there is an effect, they didn't have enough people in the trial to be able to clarify that. And lastly, as I said earlier, a common theme is cannabinoids are very well tolerated in the human body. Patients dealt with them very well. So keeping these limitations in mind, let's talk about cannabinoids and MS pain. When you look at the plethora of small trials, as I did, what we identify is most of the trials show a couple improvements based on patient reported outcome measures. And I will share with you anecdotally, talking to hundreds upon hundreds of families in my clinic room, anecdotally, many people report to me, and I believe them, that when they use a cannabinoid product, they have less pain. This is very interesting to me. I mentioned to you that Sativex, that spray, is available in Canada. And Cadeth is the Canadian version of the FDA. And here is Cadeth's recommendation of where to place Sativex for use for pain. They don't place it first line. They don't recommend it first line. They recommend it after you failed first line pain medicines to include anti-epileptic medicines and antidepressants. They also don't recommend it second line. They place it after opioids and narcotics. And they place it third line because of the quality of the evidence and the data. Let that sink in. Shifting gears, we have had some outstanding lectures today teaching us about the down there's. And there has been studies, although small, looking at the benefits of cannabinoids to bladder. And even though there's small trials with limitations, like I mentioned, most of the trials show one or two benefits to quality of life measures looking at control of bladder. Looking at ataxia, which is doctor talk for unsteadiness on your feet, there's been a lot of investigations. Now, for any of you that attended college and maybe came in contact with cannabinoids or read about them on the interwebs, it's not a surprise that it doesn't work to improve your balance. 
And so that's been borne out through the scientific studies. So if you're looking to improve your balance, I would not recommend this as a mechanism to do so. Now, I want to spend a few minutes and talk about some stuff that, quite frankly, surprised me a bit. And I'm afraid that we don't talk enough about potential side effects and risks of medical marijuana. And so please pay attention for a few more slides. I will summarize for you the data that I read about looking at the side effect profile, the, the adverse events that one might see in these trials that I've been mentioning. When you say odds ratio, what you're saying is what is the likelihood, what is the odds that you're going to have an adverse event compared to something else? And so in these trials, as compared to placebo, the likelihood that you have any adverse event is three times more likely if you used a cannabinoid product compared to placebo. And the likelihood that you have a severe event is 40% more likely compared to placebo. That's the data in numbers. But let's get into the meat of it. Remember in the beginning of my talk, I shared with you that there are endocannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2, throughout the body. And so when you're using a cannabinoid product, it's not just binding to one location. It's binding to the eye and the mouth and the lungs and the heart and the gut. And so it stands to reason that you might see side effects similar to these things and you do. And the most common side effects seen are dizziness, <laughs> dry mouth, Euphoria is considered a side effect, diarrhea, and poor concentration. And by the way, I challenge any of you on a live stream that's going across the universe to give a neuroimmunology lecture and show a poop emoji. <laughs> now, the same limitations that I shared with you as it relates to the efficacy of cannabinoids and MS apply to the assessments of safety and tolerability there really aren't any long-term studies looking at this stuff. And there aren't any active non-cannabinoid comparators. Also, there's a lot of variability in the formulations and dosing schedules, making this interpretation a bit challenging. Here's a trial that I wanted to share with you. It's not in MS pain, but it's the largest and longest trial studying safety with cannabinoids that I could find. 200 patients in each arm, and it went on for a full year. And what they did is they took people that had various forms of non-cancer pain, and they either gave them joints of marijuana, 12.5% THC, that's about 2.5 grams, as compared to nothing. And so they had a group of people that were smoking pot and a group of people that weren't, and they were looking at, at side effects and tolerability. That's what the trial was for. And so I thought that was very appropriate to share with you. And here's what we see. Now, as you look down this list, my first comment was, wow, not that bad. I wish that many of the medicines I prescribed looked like that when you look at the side effect profile. When you look at the less common adverse events, again, pretty darn uncommon. And most importantly, there were zero severe adverse events noted in this one-year clinical trial studying smoked cannabis in over 200 patients. Good information to know. Now, this slide bothered me the very most during my preparation for this chit chat, because we talk a lot in MS about the concerns of tobacco smoke and how it can speed up MS almost by 50% according to some trials. And what I maybe am, have been lax in doing, and I feel kind of guilty about this guys, is, is not talking about the cardiovascular concerns of smoked cannabis. It turns out, and I guess it stands to reason, that if you're lighting cannabis on fire and breathing in the smoke, that you are at increased risk of some stuff that you might not want, including heart attack, stroke, hypertension, etc. But the following statistic bothered me the very most. After smoking one joint, your risk of heart attack goes up times five for about an hour. And I didn't know that before I prepared for this lecture. And that's information that I think is rather important to share. Has anyone ever heard of the cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome? Raise your hand. I hadn't. So the cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome is a doctor way of saying you puke your guts out. And this is an exceedingly rare syndrome. It was described by Allen and colleagues in 2004 for the first time. And prior to the legalization of marijuana in Colorado was almost never described. 
And it's a very interesting syndrome. It seems to only impact some chronic daily cannabis users. And it has three phases. There's a prodromal phase where the cannabis user wakes up and feels nauseated and is concerned they're going to throw up, but they don't. And they're able to eat a normal breakfast. And phase two of the syndrome is that they throw up violently, uncontrollably for hours to days. And they learn a behavior called hot baths. When the cannabis user who's puking their guts out gets into a hot shower, instantly the vomiting stops and they feel better until they exit the shower and they start throwing up again. And so what you see is a cycling of puking and hot bath, puking and hot bath that can go on for hours to days, followed by phase three, which is recovery for days to months before it cycles again. We don't know why this happens. There's theories that maybe there's oversaturation of THC receptors, which frankly is confusing to me, or there may be contaminants in the THC. This is extremely rare, but I wanted to bring it to your attention. There is a literature looking at psychiatric side effects of cannabinoids. And the punchline is that in at-risk population, there's a slight increased risk of having psychosis. Exceedingly rare. But again, I want to sensitize you to an at-risk population. Adolescents, people with a personal history of prior psychosis, and people with a family history of schizophrenia are at slight risk. In the medical literature, there's a question whether or not cannabis could increase the risk of suicidality. And the punchline after well studying is the answer is no. It does not increase the risk of suicidality. Bueller. Oh, there we go. Cannabis and MS cognition. Now, when I say the word cannabis, I'm talking about ganja, marijuana. And the reason this is important to me is the number one reason people leave the workforce with MS is not because they can't walk. It's because they have trouble with thinking and memory and with energy. And so the fact that there may be some concerns about cognition, I think is relevant to folks impacted by MS. Now, this was a trial of some interest to me. They took 140 people that have MS and they gave them a survey and said, do you ever smoke pot? And the people that said that they smoked more than once a month were considered, quote, chronic users. The reason is that if you use more than once a month, this is stored in your fat and you'll test positive at any point in time. And so that was how they defined it in the trial. This is a group of people who were chronic users and then the other group were not chronic users. And all the people in the trial completed neuropsychometric testing. They did cognitive tests. And for those of us that work in MS, these are very standard tests to study MS. What they found bothered me. The cannabis users, the people that said they used at least once a month, perform statistically much worse on measures of cognition, particularly working memory. And moreover, there was a really weird finding. This impacted boys with MS who smoked way more than girls with MS that smoked. There was a gender interaction. Keeping in mind that men with MS tend to have a more aggressive disease course, and keeping in mind that the leading cause of loss of work is cognition, I found that bothersome. Now, in counterpoint to what I just said about smoked cannabis, we do not see cognitive impairment with Sativex, the oral mucosal spray. And there's a trial that they call long-term because it went out 48 weeks. Okay, that's long-term here. And what they saw is over the entire course of the trial, using Sativex did not interfere with cognition or mood. Now, why is that possible? I think it goes back to that graph I showed you and the way that we stimulate or oversaturate the receptors. It's kind of a different sport. And this finding has been replicated in multiple different trials studying Sativex. It does not impair cognition. Good to know. Tolerance is a phenomenon where you're repeatedly exposed to a drug, and as a result, your body gets used to it and you see less of an impact. And smoked cannabis is associated with a degree of tolerance. Sativex is not. And this is also very interesting. There's two trials that have incomplete follow-up for a period of a year, really long time in this literature. And what they found was people using Sativex don't need to increase their dose, they don't develop more side effects, and they maintain the efficacy at the same dose going out a year. 
So again, in counterpoint to smoked cannabis, Sativex does not appear to induce tolerance. There is a cannabis withdrawal syndrome. Again, it's extremely rare. Most cannabis users will never experience this. And it's described predominantly in chronic heavy users. When they stop, their symptoms of irritability, insomnia, hot flashes, restlessness, nausea, and cramping. It's very uncommon, it's very rare, and it lasts a day or two before it goes away. Now, it's interesting to me that when you use a cannabinoid, it gets stored in your fat. So when you stop using, it's slowly released from your fat over weeks, which probably minimizes the withdrawal syndrome. It's kind of fascinating to me. Physical dependence is defined as unpleasant physical symptoms that a human experiences when they stop using a substance. I can't imagine what I would be like if I stopped drinking coffee. <laughs> now, here you see a list of physical dependence with common recreational drugs. With tobacco, there's almost a 70% physical dependence described. With alcohol, it's 23%. With cocaine, 20%. What do you think the number is for cannabis? I hear zero, I hear 100. It's somewhere in between there. <laughs> it's actually remarkably low. It's 9%. There's a very, very small risk of physical dependence with cannabis as compared to other products. There's a question of whether or not someone could overdose on cannabis. And the answer is no. So the reason that someone can overdose taking narcotics is because there are narcotic mu receptors in the brainstem. And the brainstem controls the breathing and the heart and whatnot. There are no endocannabinoid receptors in the brainstem. Now, Adams and colleagues did a really interesting back of the napkin math in 1996, and they figured out that you could die from cannabis if you smoked 1,500 pounds of cannabis in under 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> now, in conclusion, I am not commenting on anecdotal evidence. I have sat in rooms with hundreds upon hundreds of families with MS over the years, and many people who I trust have told me, Aaron, this helps me, and I believe them. But that's not what I was talking about today. Today, I wanted to share with you the scientific support or lack thereof for so-called medical marijuana. And I'll remind you of the Whiting summary that there was a moderate statistically significant benefit to cannabinoids in spasticity as it related to patient report, but we were unable to show an objective benefit. Where does that leave us? Cannabis is a very, very complicated plant with over a hundred biologically active phytocannabinoids discovered. We don't know what they all do just yet. Some of those compounds are probably helpful to manage MS symptoms. But as I've shared with you over the last half an hour, the overall quality of the data to date is a bit limited. In my opinion, the future of cannabinoids is in developing specific derivatives pharmaceutically that have specific targets and minimize side effects. And a wonderful example is a newly approved FDA therapy, a derivative of sativa, which is available to treat a certain type of epilepsy. Thank you for your attention. Right now we're gonna ask all eight presenters to come to the stage. I'm gonna be over here. Anybody have questions? Please show me your hands. Thank you. Let's begin. Dr. Nicholas, um, how long do you think until there's an effective blood test for the NFL? So I think that currently uh, there's an effective test for it, but really what needs to be developed is the, the reference ranges based on age of the person and uh, type of MS. 
So uh, there, currently it's being studied in research and um, you know, we've been de debating of how to snag a machine so we could do this in our clinic, but haven't officially plotted that out yet. Um, but I think that in the coming years, that will be a test that we will be able to use. Um, but I think you know, time will tell. We need a little bit more research, so stay tuned. We'll keep you updated. Anybody have questions here? Who had a question on this side? Thank you. Um, this is for Dr. Eubanks. You said something about cranberries. I wanted to ask about eating cranberries for their vitamin effect. So the, the data for cranberries was primarily for prevention of urinary tract infections. And I think it could be done either with cranberries themselves. They also sell cranberry tablets, which is just the extract of that. So I think either that and or cranberry juice, all of them potentially have the benefit. There's no great data on exactly how much to take in there. But I think it does, if you're someone that does struggle with frequent urinary tract infections, certainly something you could talk with your physician about, but that's something you might be able to do on top of that. Question down there? Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if you would at all be willing to share your MS story? That would take me over 20 years. <laughs> Um, I've, in a nutshell, I've had about every symptom you could have physically, and now I don't have any. That's my, that's my story in a nutshell, but I've taken good care of myself and religiously took my meds and religiously kept my workout and diet clean. So uh, I did everything I possibly could. That's my, that's, my, <laughs> that's my way of getting to where I'm at right now, but that's my story. Thank you. And for Dr. Boster, um, relative then back to the CBD oil, um, would you comment on that? I'd be happy to. CBD is not a controlled substance. It's not illegal. It's commercially available throughout the entire union. And CBD stimulates that CB2 receptor I talked about. And so there's no psychoactive properties. You can't get high off CBD. I wanted very much to share with you the clinical trial data on CBD, particularly in pain. And the reason you didn't see trials is because there's almost no research. Now please let that sink in because you can purchase CBD and it'll say this is good for and it'll list out a bunch of stuff. But there's no data supporting that that I could find in the medical literature. That is not to say it doesn't help people. I've had a lot of people come see me and they say, Doc, when I do this, wow. And I, and I believe them anecdotally, but there is a lack of evidence to support its use right now. And so I hope that's an area of active research as we try to better understand what it is, how it is, and how much to take and what it works for. Thanks for asking the question. Dr. Foster? Yes? <laughs> uh, can you give me your thoughts on stem cell research? Sure. So stem cell research sounds super sexy. Just get your bone marrow swapped out and make that disease go away. The reality is that stem cell research has been going on for almost 20 years and we're, it's still not prime time. The, it looks like in very selected safe clinical trials, when you use a stem cell transplant on a very, very young, very, very active inflammatory patient, that many of them can be helped. The mortality, the death rate associated with stem cells is not zero. And it was as high as 10% just 10 years ago. It's getting a bit better. My strong opinion and the opinion I believe of my colleagues up here is that we should not do stem cell transplantation in a tourist manner. There are exotic places around the world like India and Mexico and Chicago where you can go and give someone $20,000 and they'll swap out your bone marrow maybe. And it's not done in a controlled fashion, and there's oftentimes a complete lack of long-term follow-up for these patients, and it's my strong fear that they're put at risk. I do believe that in the next decade, stem cell transplantation will become part of the MS armamentarium, particularly amongst highly active, aggressive patients, but it is not yet prime time. Question here? 
Uh, for Dr. Nicholas or Dr. Boster, whichever, uh, what is a T2 lesion? So a T2 lesion is a spot that you can see on the MRI. So when, uh, when our patients are in clinic, we always show them their MRIs. And there's one type of scan where the, all of the damage that has occurred over time from someone's MS, all of the spots look bright. And so that's actually a type of sequence called a T2, where it brings up any abnormality as being bright. And then in neurology, we use the term lesion just to be confusing and sound smart, but really it just means an abnormality. But in MS, when we say a T2 lesion, that's one of those bright spots that you see when we look at the MRI. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Eubank, you had shown a slide regarding um, diagnosis above the equator and how they're trying to determine whether or not that has an effect with MS. Do you think that might have anything to do with the possibility of getting good health care below the equator that might have something that affects that study? Uh, it's, it looks like it's been borne out that it's probably not a factor of uh, whether you can acquire health care or not. There's some other interesting studies. You can go to places in Scandinavia and the same sunlight exposure thing seems to exist. And by that I mean if you live down at sea level versus up on a mountain, you get more sunlight exposure up on a mountain. It's just a small little example. But just that difference seemed to have a difference with the incidence of MS as well. So I really do think there's something biologically about uh, the amount of sunlight exposure, which certainly strongly suggests that vitamin D is part of that equation. Um, not proof, but certainly strong, strong evidence. But I really think it's primarily uh, driven by that. Obviously, lack of ac access to health care doesn't help anybody, but I don't think that explains the geographic differences there. But good question. Uh, first of all, thank you to the whole board for everything you do, uh, research, MS. We can't thank you enough. Um, okay, that's out of the way. Uh, I wonder if one of you, um, not anybody in specific, but one of you might speak on kinesiology. I spoke with you, Dr. Boster, a few weeks ago on a um, Facebook Live feed. I asked about this. I wasn't really sure if anybody else has had any experience with this, but, but I've done a little research on kinesiology. Anybody have any comments on that on the board? Kinesiology is a study of human movement. That's it. I mean, um, human movement and MS, that when human movement's altered, that means something's going wrong with MS. So the study of kinesiology is important to see what movement patterns have changed or what movement patterns may um, be getting better or worse. But that's basically kinesiology and MS go hand in hand when you're talking about motor, um, motor skills and that type. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Want me to repeat that? <laughs> no, but that's kinesiology is important because that's what, as, a, as practitioners, they watch people move and whatever movements that they've taken as a baseline, they can compare to the future, so, um, you know, future studies with the person. So it's important to know kinesiology in any aspect of treatment when you're working with MS. To, to piggyback off that, one outstanding clinical application of kinesiology is that of physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech therapy. And these are ninja warriors that make you move better. And what's really awesome about PTOT and speech pathologists is they don't necessarily get into the why, you get into the how. So it's not so, so much that they need to sort out why you have a hitch in your giddy up. They're trying to figure out how to make that hitch better. And that is rooted in our understanding of movement and kinesiology. Very, very important. Uh, Dr. Nichols, I actually have a question about the NFL. Now, you had said that you can identify the properties and you can kind of identify when somebody's having a relapse, but is there a way that you could actually tell if they're having, say, the beginning stages of a relapse before going into the full-blown where then it's going to show the lesion and then, 
you know, is there a way to tell the difference between MS and other neurological diseases with it? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so when we look at the studies that have been done about predict using NFL to predict relapse, the challenge has been that the levels were drawn at the time of the MS relapse or sometime after. I think that there will be data that we can look at uh, over time because this is a really exciting area of research where maybe they're gonna monitor people and see that there may be you know, higher levels noted right before the individual experiences symptoms. And I, knowing what we know about NFL and how the levels change, I would suspect that it, that it does start to go up before the actual symptom onset. But again, I think that we need more data to say that, but that's one of our hopes that that may be something to help us know, you know, as a, a predictor so that we could actually change what's going to happen. Um, currently, when we look at the blood levels, there are uh, median ranges of what we see in different neurologic diseases, but I don't believe that we'll be able to use NFL to say this individual has multiple sclerosis versus this individual has Alzheimer's disease versus this individual has ALS. I think that we'll still need to do what we do as doctors to do a differential diagnosis and examine people and talk to people, but that the test will be more helpful for disease monitoring and uh, potentially prognosis when coming in and also the response to treatment. You're welcome. Next question's here. Hi. Got it. Oh, sorry. My question is for Tracy. Um, so, as you see, I'm very young, and you too. <laughs> but how how would you explain to friends, people that you know, family about your disease? Mostly, because as a young person, when they see you're like, you look healthy. There's nothing wrong with you. How do you go about? Hey, I'm blind out of one eye. <laughs> hey, I was just in a wheelchair. How, how do you make people understand that without sounding rude? I don't, hello, okay, I was making sure this mic worked. That's a wonderful question, and um, I think there's a couple ways we can attack that. One, I think um, bringing your friends and your family to your clinic visits, to our support group gatherings, to activities, to these educational opportunities, they can see that those symptoms that you have are invisible, and they're real. Um, I think that's a great way to, to start. Um, and then I think another thing is from those support group gatherings, talking to the people that have been in your position, I take in and I can tell you what people tell me, but I think building those relationships with people who have your similar experience will help you um, get answers to questions like that as you move forward. Let's congratulate this person. She came all the way from Chicago today. Thank you. That's right, and her husband, her driver, great. Okay. Before we move on, if I can uh, make a plug for um, a book. Um, now, we don't get a kickback, and I don't know the company, but there's a series of books out called MediKids, M-E-D-I-K-I-D-Z. Has anyone ever heard of MediKids? So MediKids are a series of graphic novels, and, and you can get them on Amazon. And it's, um, it's cartoons created for children to understand complex diseases like breast cancer and diabetes and multiple sclerosis. And the MS book is outstanding, and it's not just for children. And I have found that to be a very helpful way to help young people and less young people understand MS. It's written at a level that's easily digestible, and the information is outstanding. And so one option is to check out this MediKids book on MS. I, I really find it to be super. This question is for Dr. Eubank. Um, you had mentioned that you stopped taking many supplements over time as you learned of some of the dangers of taking them. I was wondering if you could share with us uh, some of those dangers. And the other question was, um, uh, are some of the uh, vitamins uh, mandatory that you mentioned, some of the vitamins, are they mandatory because they're not found in foods? 
So uh, my, you know, I shared my particular story because I think I'm like a lot of you. We're always trying to, you know, we want to do all the right things and try and make up for our deficiencies and things like that. So used to take a multivitamin, stopped taking that in part because it was really hard to show it was helping people. And then there was some people that showed that mortality was higher. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it doesn't look like it's helping. Same thing with vitamin E. That one does look like in the studies that there could be a higher rate of death for those that were taking vitamin E. The problem with any of these studies, though, I should point out is these aren't proof that they are harmful. It just means that the ta people taking them ended up having a worse outcome. That's different than doing a randomized clinical trial where you assign similar groups, similar treatments. So the person who might take something with vitamin E like I did, I took it because I thought it might help because I might have a history of, family history of heart disease. Well, that probably influences the fact that I'm taking vitamin E in the first place. So that changes the data a little bit. So I do wanna be cautious about that. Um, fish oil was another one uh, that thought maybe there was a benefit for a few different areas and it turned out the best we could find out is it might increase the risk for prostate cancer. So again, same thing over and over again and I finally said, you know what, I think what I mostly need to do is eat a really good, clean, healthy plant-based diet to start with and then try to take away a lot of the processed foods and things like that. So that's how I approach things. Now, by the way, I'm not treating, I wasn't treating any specific disease either. I was just trying to be helpful. Um, so really what we do with our patients, uh, we do pay a lot of attention to vitamin D, especially because of the bone health issues, and we measure it, and we supplement, and then we re-measure. Above and beyond that, uh, if we find out someone is deficient in a vitamin, we test for it and we treat for that, but by and large, we're not recommending specific supplementation beyond that. Just want to make one other comment there uh, based on those comments. So there are actually vitamins that uh, if, if you take too much of them, they could become harmful. So it is really important that if you're going to take a vitamin, I would check with your doctor. Um, you know, for instance, even vitamin D that we recommend, if somebody's levels became too high, that could, that could cause serious problems. It could pull your calcium into the blood and, and cause a, an arrhythmia of your heart. So that's why we do monitor those over time to be safe. And then uh, some of the B vitamins out there like B6, that can actually damage your nerves if you take too much. So again, I wouldn't just go out and take uh, vitamins just because uh, you know the bottle says it might help you, but I would actually just check with whoever's providing your MS care to make sure it's a, it's a good idea. Um, but overall, you know, I think that there are some really interesting supplements out there that people take and that make them feel better. But I think just checking in and making sure that it's not something that's going to interfere with your disease or with the medicines you're already taking. There are a lot of supplements out there that are touted to boost your immune system. And I think when you have MS, you think, well, gosh, maybe I should take something to help my immune system. And so I've had a lot of uh, patients come in and tell me that, that they're taking something like that. But our concern is there hasn't been enough research. And so we worry if we're boosting your immune system that's already overactive when you have multiple sclerosis, that you might actually be activating it up. And could that potentially lead to a relapse or more disease activity? So again, just always a good idea. If there's something you're interested in taking, just run it by your doc. And then we make sure that if it's a safe thing or not uh, to proceed with. So even the water-soluble vitamins are sometimes can be dangerous if you take too much. Can you repeat that, please? So yeah, so what he said is even water soluble vitamins, could those potentially be dangerous? And the answer is yes. So if you are are just randomly taking certain vitamins, so B6 is one of those, that uh, actually, if you have too much of it, could cause uh, serious nerve damage, a, a painful burning neuropathy. But interestingly, if you don't have enough, it could cause a neuropathy. So again, it's just, um, I think there's such widespread use of supplements, and I think some of them can be really beneficial for quality of life, but we just wanna make sure that we're not causing another problem in addition to what we're trying to do by taking it. Okay, Tennis World, we're now down this way. Okay, this, this question is for Dr. Boster. Um, I'm wondering if there is a lack of studies um, in cannabis because um, it's been illegal for so long in this country. I'm also wondering um, if the pharmaceutical companies 
um, and or hospitals might not believe in this, so they will produce studies that show the opposite. And lastly, um, you talked about the uh, throwing up syndrome. And I see that more with alcohol and trying to come off pharmaceuticals um, than I do um, with marijuana, oil in particular. <clears throat> and, um, and I just, I think that if I, I heard this once and I think that, and I'm wondering what you think, how you feel about this. If I had an older child with MS and they came to me and they were, because of pain and spasticity, they were um, addicted to pharmaceuticals or um, marijuana, oil, or um, pharmaceuticals or alcohol, I would, if I had to pick one, I would rather my child smoke marijuana than be addicted to alcohol or pharmaceuticals. Excellent point, Susie. Um, she brings up several things that we'll unpack really quickly. The first one is, that, well, is it possible that there's a paucity of data because it's illegal? And the answer is yes. So there, it's, it's harder to study a substance that's been identified as a controlled substance. Another example is cocaine. So there isn't a lot of research in cocaine because it's an illegal substance. And I think that you're absolutely right that in, in our society, there is, there's a stigma attached to ganja and there's a stigma attached to cannabinoids. I'll give you a quick example. Um, we explored doing a study, a small study at Ohio Health where we work in, um, with CBD. And we were politely asked to please not do that. And that's not because the administrators are nasty people, it's because it's terribly politically charged and it, it, it butts up against some big legal concerns. So I do think that influences things, absolutely. The hyperemesis syndrome that I talked about uh, is extremely rare. It's so rare, I, I've certainly never seen it. I don't know if any other uh, clinicians up here have ever seen it. It's described in the literature. And, it's, and, and I personally, have not thrown up from a hyperemesis syndrome from cannabinoids. I have thrown up multiple times because I had bad experiences with tequila in college. <laughs> um, so I, I but, but what I'm specifically talking about is a little bit different. It's this weird syndrome and people can't control it. Um, and the only reason I brought it up is because it's something that I had never heard about and I wanted to sensitize you in the room that it existed. Your, your comments about um, uh, recreational drugs and pharmaceutical drugs, I, I hear you. And I, I want to make very clear that I am not telling people today that the stuff doesn't work or that it does work. And I have sat in rooms with people for over a decade and they, and people that I trust and believe, people that refuse to use controlled substances, they don't want to get high, and the only thing they've found that have helped them sleep through the night is, say, cannabis oil. I don't think they're making it up. I think it's probably true for them. But as we talk about in our culture, medical fill in the blank, I think it's important that we understand the research and science behind the comment. And so what I'm pointing out isn't success or failure, it's a paucity of research and it's a call to action that we have to study this better so that we can better understand it. Thanks for bringing that up. Other side of the room. This is for Karina. Um, I am a private home caregiver to a husband and wife. They're both 75. He has Parkinson's and I will tell you um, his bladder issues bother him more than anything else in his day-to-day -day life and this is somebody 75 with Parkinson's. That is his main focus all the time. Um, so I really appreciate the information that you gave. I know that sometimes it's a tough subject to talk about or to admit that you deal with, but it is a very real thing, so I appreciate you being here. Um, so I have a tendency to be a little over compulsive. I was wondering, can you over Kegel? Uh, yeah, you can actually. <laughs> you can do too many, absolutely. Um, so... <laughs> 
First of all, you meet, you need to make sure you're doing kegels right, um, and that's a, that's a huge thing. Is most people that come into my office are not doing them correctly at all. So when you're not doing them correctly, and then you're doing too many of them, you do risk uh, uh, over stimulating some some of the wrong muscles. The other thing that we can see is that if you do them too often, it can make the muscles too tight. And then that's where you're going to have those issues with uh, relaxing in order to be able to go to the bathroom, either urination or defecation. So, you know, we really, um, I tell people when you're strengthening a muscle, if you wanted to strengthen your bicep, you wouldn't do this 3,000 times a day, would you? No, you would You would do it a prescribed amount and, and you would do it um, several times throughout the day. So there is um, a, a nice balance. And that's why we really say if you're doing 10 contractions of the quick ones and the slow ones, so about 60 to 80 contractions a day, that is plenty to maintain a good, healthy pelvic floor. Okay. And um, re really quick, another, because uh, that was more funny, but also honest. Um, the squatty potty, so I had recommended that for him, and I I haven't had it, but I, you know, it's on my things to do list on buying it. But I'm wondering for people with balance issues, because a lot of people in this room do, um, is the squatty potty something where maybe having a physical therapist come to the house and show how to use it? Because, you know, it could be a fall risk, or could it not? So, I mean, the thing about the squatty potty is that it's just a bench that's underneath the toilet. So if you, as long as you can kind of kick it out from underneath your feet, you're safe to use it. But some of my patients that get a little dizzy when they kind of bend down, generally what I'll recommend is you just need to get into more of a squatted position. And that can be achieved by just resting your forearms on, on your thighs. Um, you just need to have a little bit of hip mobility in order to do it. Um, the main goal though is that you're not sitting like this, you're not sitting, you know, back on your chair, um, or you're not doing what I call the, exactly, you're not doing the poop Olympics where you're like going around and around and trying to, you know, work it out. Um, that's, that's not good for you. So, um, but yeah, if you have balance issues, all you have to do is kind of come up a little bit into a semi-squat position. Great. Next question's here. Uh, it's for Dr. Shaw. Uh, about uh, I have a friend that has extreme dry mouth, and uh, she's used uh, over-the-counter biotin and other remedies. Do, is there a remedy for dry mouth? Not specifically. So why do you have the dry mouth or the patient? Uh, she takes uh, uh, supplements uh, like uh, calcium but, but with uh, D3 and uh, other medication, for modifying medication for uh, MS. I mean, specifically, we do use biotin. I think that's probably one of the best one we have. Uh, if there are specific medications causing dry mouth, then they probably should stop. Otherwise, we usually ask patients to either use, you know, frequent use of, uh, you know, keep water bottle with them or chewing gum or a lemon candy or something that can just help, you know, something that can stimulate, you know, salivation. But uh, if any specific medication is causing that, then certainly need to look into it. Um, sometimes we see patients who get, uh, because of severe dry mouth, like, you know, dental caries and, you know, re really bad gum problems. So if it comes to that serious, then definitely needs to be looked into that. So, Before we go to the other side of the room, somebody actually wrote to me from watching on live stream. And they had a question for Jessica. Because they couldn't hear what was going on with when you were doing the at-home thing. And they wanted to hear it again. So... Do you mind repeating what you were doing before when you were telling people to do something from their homes or doing something from their seats? Yeah. So what I was asking the audience to do was start to, um, making their personal wellness plan. So picking one or two action items that you want to start working on today after walking away from all the information that you've gained. And that can be either physical wellness or emotional wellness. But the goal of this was to make goals for yourself and find something to improve upon and move forward with that today. And we ask that that be a SMART goal to make sure it's something that's actually achievable and attainable for you to walk away from today. Thank you. Other side? This is for Dr. Boster. You mentioned stem cells being a transplant. And I know somebody that she doesn't have an MS, but she has another walking problem. And at, at OSU, <laughs> she got stem cell injections. What are those? 
so again, stem cells sound sexy as heck. Sounds like Star Trek. You just inject the stem cells and magic things happen and everything's better. And there's a lot uh, to be understood as far as what the stem cells actually are, what their purpose is, how they're given. So for example, there is some really provocative research studying stem cells injected into a beat up joint of the, of the arm, like the elbow, and then helping reconstitute components in the joint. That's not what we're really talking about when we talk about a systemic autoimmune condition like lupus or multiple sclerosis. In these conditions, we're doing something rather different with stem cell transplantation. It's a three-step process. Step one is they extract stem cells out of your body and put them on ice. Step two is they murder you. They give you lethal doses of chemo and radiation and they remove permanently your immune response. And if they stopped, you would pass away. And then step three, before you die, they give you back your stem cells and pray that they take. And it's a very different process than injecting stem cells into a joint. And so I think in order to answer the question, we have to consider A, why we're doing it, and B, the actual cell lines that we're using, because it's rather specific for various conditions. Question? Question here? Question here. This is for Dr. Shaw and Karina. Um, we're talking about urinary health. And do you, either or both of you, have a sequence of what you would do in terms of treatment? How you would begin and then what you would progress to if there wasn't significant improvement? So are we talking about urinary incontinence? Okay, yes. So, you know, when you come to us, uh, as I discussed with you first, definitely getting into the details why the incontinence is happening. Because it could be that you have an overactive bladder, or it is certainly possible that you are actually in retention and now you are overflowing. So, those history basic office evaluations are the first and foremost thing then every single patient, we tell them to do behavioral therapy because that's something that you can do at home. It's simple, simple lifestyle changes everybody should do. The second thing which I always tell patients to do is time voiding or bladder training because one of the biggest challenge in MS patients essentially is the mobility, you know, for the patients to reach from the time they feel they need to go to the bathroom to reach the bathroom, which could be 30 seconds, 45 seconds, a minute. So these are the simple things which we tell every single patient to try. Then depending on how much these things are bothering them, I usually like to start them on medications. If they've already tried some medications, then depending on you know what level they are, we would go to the next step. Um, I also offer them to do some basic, simple physical therapy like Kegel, you know, if feels that that could be a problem, or even refer them to a physical therapist, you know, and that I think is very helpful as well. So, um, but again, every single patient, we strive with simple measures first. Medications would be in the next line, phys plus minus physical therapy. Yeah, so I work very closely with uh, Dr. Shaw and all of our other urologists uh, with urinary incontinence. And as he said, it, it just depends on where the problem is. Is the problem in the bladder or is the bladder fine and it's the pelvic floor muscles and that's why you're leaking? Or is it a combination of the two? So, um, but often it is just behavioral and lifestyle changes. Again, we just get into really bad habits as adults. And so uh, many times just modifying those lifestyle changes um, are, are enough to help um, significantly decrease that urinary incontinence uh, and then we kind of work with the medications as well. We have 10 minutes remaining in this Q&A and we're going to go right there next. This is for Dr. Nicholas or Dr. Boster. You had talked about the biomarkers if someone is already having symptoms. Is there any testing for say my children, my grandchildren that would show that they would be prone to having something like MS before they actually have the symptoms? So uh, not currently. Uh, 
for somebody who has MS, if uh, you're the only person in your family who has multiple sclerosis, the risk of your child developing MS would be increased only about two to three percent higher than that of somebody else, somebody else's children or grandchildren who have no family members with MS. So because that risk is so incredibly low, we actually don't recommend proactively going out and doing testing to try to determine if somebody has demyelination or is developing multiple sclerosis. The, um, the problem lies in, you know, sometimes we will have individuals who get referred to our clinic because they had uh, maybe another problem that led to them getting an MRI. And actually, you know, maybe they have some abnormality and we don't know if it looks like an early sign of MS, demyelination, or if it's just something that's been there their entire life. And so that can be really stressful. And there's actually been studies that have shown that sometimes in asymptomatic family members of individuals with MS, they may have a few abnormalities that look demyelinating but never go on to develop multiple sclerosis. And so uh, it's currently not a recommendation to do any testing for that. But what we do recommend is that we know there are risk factors that are modifiable. So number one, uh, as any good mom, grandmother, grandfather, grandparent, uh, you're obviously going to tell your children please don't smoke, and from an early age, explain to them that tobacco smoke uh, increases the risk of MS. So that's one thing, among other things. And then in terms of vitamin D, we know that lower vitamin D levels are associated with a higher, uh, an increased risk of developing MS. So it's something that we always tell people if their kids are young, ask your pediatrician uh, what might be a safe amount of vitamin D for your child to take. And at some point when they're getting a blood test, it might be appropriate for them to get their vitamin D level checked. Um, but those are the two things that we really can recommend right now. And then we could write you a prescription to move to Florida near Stewart. Um, up until the age of 15, that further decreases the risk. But most of us are stuck here in the great Buckeye State. Before we get to the next question, if anybody is leaving the room, please remember to fill out the sem seminar evaluation forms and either drop them off right here at the corner of this stage or just leave them on your tables. Thank you. This is kind of a combined question for the entire panel. It was touched on a little bit about um, frankincense, the essential oil. From your professional point of view in all different areas, because there are so many oils that are out there and everyone's saying, this is great for you, this is going to help you this way, what are your opinions on using essential oils and have you noticed that they do help? So whenever um, someone discusses uh, a complementary medicine with me, um, I always think about three things. And I define a complementary medicine as something that I wasn't taught about in school. Doesn't mean it doesn't work, it just means I wasn't taught about it in school. So to make that point, uh, here in the United States, we consider acupuncture complementary. In China, it's standard of care. Just I wasn't taught about it. And so I have three rules when I'm considering complementary medicine. The first one is, it can't be too expensive. And so each individual human has to decide if frankincense is too expensive or if the complementary medicine there, because there are some that can be very pricey. That's the first one. The second one is it can't be dangerous. And as we've talked about today, and as Dr. Eubank touched on, certain complementary medicines could potentially hurt you. And so obviously we don't want you to do that. The third thing is, it can't be instead of something that we think works. So if you told me that you were going to do frankincense instead of your disease-modifying therapy, that would make me really sad. So if I think about frankincense, it smells great, and it's not expensive, and it's probably not dangerous, and if you enjoy rubbing that on yourself, in addition to taking your disease-modifying therapy, hoorah! And if it helps you, I'm delighted. But I think as long as we keep those three things in mind, we can navigate sort of these things that are outside of traditional allopathic medicine. Just my two cents. Nobody else up there? Because I have a question back here. For Jeff Siegel, for the person that's been running around all day on his feet and hasn't had much water because he didn't want any bladder issues, how does he stop leg cramps from happening tonight? Don't drink alcohol and drink a lot of water. <laughs> keep, 
keep yourself <laughs> hydrated. If, Thank you. if being dehydrated is what's causing it, then you got the fix right in your hand. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Who's next? We just have a few minutes remaining. Anybody have a question? Does everybody, did everybody like what happened here today? By a show of hands, we need to know who thought it was too long. Great. That's awesome. I don't want to hear anybody complaining on their evaluations then, all right? Or I don't want to read it either. So again, though, I should go to the front of the room now, right? And more walking. I want to thank you all. MS Views and News would like to thank Ohio Health for doing everything that they did today to help make this event possible for those in your community. All right, we'd like to thank Jeff Siegel too, but he's not part of Ohio Health. I personally would like to thank all of you for coming here today. I would like to thank Ohio Health for making this happen. There are people who wrote to us asking how we can make this for more people. Okay, that there are that many more people out here. So I'm gonna have to let you all call Ohio Health and say we need to do this again, and we need to do it for more people. Okay, so they are the sponsors of this. They want to make sure that people are learning everything that they can about multiple sclerosis. It goes way beyond just the medications as you learned today. So let's give them again a round of applause for everything that they did. That's even better. And I'd like to thank, thank you all again for doing this. I hope you all drive carefully going home today, and thank you for being our guests.